coming and worshiping with us in person if you're ever close. As we begin our service today, we'll be singing page 182, My Savior's Love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he can love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Father, we love you and we praise your holy name. Lift our love up to you and we give thanks for your love and your grace. Father, we pray for the ones on our prayer list. Give them strength and comfort. Be with the ones who are attending to them. Our Father, we, we're so thankful for your precious son, Jesus, who gave his life for each and every one of us. And that's why we're here today, to listen and, and read his word and proclaim his love for the world. We love you, Father. Forgive us when we have fallen short. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Psalm 145. <laughs> I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are over all his works. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your God and your godly ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power, to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. We've come together today to worship, to praise, to glorify, and to declare his praises. <clears throat> Give her 
come to you and we thank you so much God for loving us for loving us in the way that you do for loving us and giving your son to die on the cross for us for loving us and giving us your spirit to dwell within us for loving us and providing all that we need we could go on and on father of all the ways that you have loved us Father, our love to you just seems so small. But we love you. And we thank you for being our God. In your son's name, amen. Good morning. Good to have you all here this morning. And it's good to be here. We've got some little partners here today that it's been a while since we've seen Lily and Wyatt and it's good to have them with us this morning um, they're getting taller okay and and uh, it's good to see you it really is good to have you here and um, we uh, are still in Habakkuk but um, we're, we're going we're gonna to go to Habakkuk later on in our sermon okay um, I'd like to encourage you to, lo to look at Luke chapter 12 and we'll get there in a little bit how many of you remember and I've got to look at this and read it because I've got to make sure I read her name correctly, okay? Because it's a long name. Leona Mindy Rosenthal Helmsley. How many of you remember that name? She, she was a billionaire in her time, and she owned many uh, a string of hotels and, and also owned the uh, Empire State Building. But if you remember back in 1989, she was convicted of... Um, of, uh, of tax evasion, spent some time in prison. You don't have to spend time in prison today for tax evasion, just to let you know. Doesn't have to, no, I'm just joking with you. <laughs> Depends on who you are, I guess. Um, but uh, when, she came out of, when she came out of prison, she was uh, just a tyrant, a tight wad tyrant. And um, she would uh, take money from anybody she could take money from. Uh, in fact, her son died, and she took her, his wife to court and uh, took everything that he, he had uh, away from her and left her, listen to this, with $2,171 and left each one of her kid, his kids with $432. The love of a mom. <laughs> I mean, come on. You know, and just, uh, anyway, greed, greed can make you some, do some crazy things. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Look with me to verse 16 through 20 of Luke chapter 12. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. 
and began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? And then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there will store, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have, you have many uh, goods laid, laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? It's interesting that this parable comes after someone um, almost demands something from Jesus. If you read that in there in, in verse 12, it's almost as a, a demand that he has here. And he says, the, and he says tell, he tells Jesus, he says, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance. Now, I don't know if you understand how back then how family inheritance were divided. The oldest always got half. And then the rest of the kids got what was left over, Okay. And so if it was in my family, my brother Jeff would get half of the estate, and I would probably get the smallest portion because I'm the youngest, all right? And, um, and so, uh, but in this story, it, it's almost um, implied, if you will, uh, that the oldest one is the one that's asking this question of Jesus. So the oldest one who has gotten, because of, of the, uh, the topic is greed, um, he has gotten half of the estate, and he's now saying, asking Jesus, tell my brother to share his portion with me, to share his inheritance with me. And so that's just a kind of a speculation. I did some research on that, and most of the commentaries said that same thing. Maybe these words would be better words to use. I want more. <laughs> Have you ever said, I want more? Give me more. Give me more. Give me this. Give me that. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I always remember growing up in, 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 in this family of five you know, dad would portion out the food, and we'd pass our plates, and dad would dip things out. And now, when we got older, we were, able, we were able to dip what we wanted to, but we were always told to eat what you got. You know, if you dipped out so much, you eat it all, okay? And you stayed at the table until you did. I'm just telling, telling you. That's the way it was, all right? And so, uh, you know, as the youngest, I would get the last portion. My, my, dad would, well, my dad would get the last portion, but as the youngest, I would, you know, my plate would go last, you know, and, and I always wanted more. That's why I am the way I am. I always want more food, you know. And so uh, that's the mindset, though, if you will, in this situation is, is that this guy wants more. He has enough, but he wants more. And in between those requests, okay, in between the requests and what Jesus, and Jesus tells this parable, he says this in verse 15. Jesus says this before he tells that. He says, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. Now, I want us to emphasize that aspect. We, when we think about greed, we're always thinking about money. Okay? And we're going to find out the definition of greed here, and you might shed a different light on that. All right? But he goes, be, guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions all right so he's just putting things uh, boy that's not that's probably not a, a, a something that a lot of people in our world wants to hear today that that your life is not about your possessions uh, i could even say this that your life is not about your accomplishments it really isn't and, and we make life about that in our society don't we we make life about what we have how much we have how much i've accomplished we push our kids to get a college education not that that's wrong but we almost do this comparison. If you don't get a college education, you're not as good as everybody else. And we somewhat have that mentality in our world. All right? And uh, it's about winning games. It's not about playing your best, about, about being a good, uh, uh, a good sports person, you know, playing fair, playing right. Um, and, and then we get in this idea that we will cheat in order to accomplish those things. How, how many people were caught in that scandal out at U.S., I think it was USC, where the parents paid for their kids, to, uh, for their kids uh, SAT tests and everything else and to be able to get in. And, 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 and some, some, of the gir some girls were even put on rowing teams and never got a rowing scholarship and never participated in rowing in the sport. You know? and, and so we see that there's this drive and this passion and this, and this lust for more. And we think, man, this is what life is about. In reality, Jesus says it's not about that. And we'll talk about that, hopefully, if I can remember uh, later on. I, I want you to give you the, the definition for the Greek word here. Uh, the actual word here in the Greek would be covetousness, okay? Same idea. Uh, greed's a little bit better for us to understand. Uh, it's the idea, 
now, now listen, this is where this idea of possession, we have to be careful that greed, you know, we don't think about just possessions, okay? Advantage. So it's desire to have advantage over someone else. Whatever it takes to have that advantage over someone else, I'm going to do. That's greedy. I, I want advantage over somebody else. It can be described in this word as aggression, all right? And, and the idea is, is I'm going to do whatever it takes to have that advantage over someone else. Desire for advantage. I, I like BibleHub.com's um, definition here. It, it, gives, it gives you the words and what it means and everything else, and then it gives you a little picture, if you will, to open up and, and give you some uh, application, if you will. Now listen to this. It is having a desire for more or lusting for, listen, for a greater number of temporal things that go beyond what God determines is eternally best, beyond His preferred will for your life. You know what it's basically saying is, is, it's basically saying this. I want more than what God wants to give me. What God believes is best for me. I have this burning desire to have more possession, more power, more authority, more influence, more, you know, more money, whatever it may be, because I don't trust God enough that he can take care of me better than I can take care of me. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. The dictionary defines it this way. The intense and selfish desire for something, especially wealth, power, or food. It reminds me of the toddler's creed. You've probably heard this before. I may have used it before. It's not the same, same, uh, um, same poem, if you will, that I used before. I couldn't find the one I'd used. But it says this. This is the toddler's creed. If I want it, it's mine. If you give it to me and I change my mind, if I give it to you and I change my mind later, it's mine. If, you, if I can take it away from you, it's mine. I think mine said one time, if I saw it first, it's mine. If I saw it last, it's mine. If I didn't see it, it's mine, you know. If I had a, if I had a little while ago, it's mine. Uh, if, if, if it's mine, it will never belong to anybody else, no matter what. If we're building something together, all the pieces are mine. <laughs> If it looks like mine, it's mine. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, we've watched kids, and, and, and you see kids, and, and they're playing with something, and, and the youngest one always wants to what that other one has, and that's mine, you know? And, and, and when you get older, it's the last piece of cake in the refrigerator. It's mine, you know? Right, Tom? Okay. Yeah, we have this desire and this burning desire to have what maybe isn't ours, but we want it. But here's the reality of it. Greed is not something that's new, and it's always been around, and it's still around. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says that Satan seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. Let's get this concept. Satan wants what is God's. Satan seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. He seeks to steal you from God, to steal your joy that God has given to you. He seeks to steal life from you. That's all from God that God has given to us. And if we are in Christ, we are God's. And so Satan's desire is to steal us from God, to kill our effectiveness, to kill our use, our vessel, the vessel that we are that God will use to accomplish his purposes to destroy us, to totally annihilate us. His desire is to take that which is not his away from God. And then we go on and we think about this idea. When Adam and Eve were tempted, um, what was it about? It was about power and control, wasn't it? He, he, in fact, he, he, didn't he say to them, you know, the problem is, this is, this is my translation, the problem is, is that God doesn't want you to think and know like he does. But, you know, that's really not fair to you. So go ahead and eat of the fruit. <laughs> Isn't that what he tempted, tempted them with? It's this idea that you need to have more than you already have. You need to have knowledge that God has, 
And he, he tempted them with that idea of greed. And what did they do? They ate of the fruit. And they ended up knowing a little bit more than what they knew. But it wasn't beneficial to them. And if we look at our lives, that's what Satan's desire is. Satan tempted them to be, that they'd be like God with the purpose of trying to take them from God. So greed isn't something new, and it isn't something that's just in the past. In the history of the leaders of our nations throughout the world, they, leaders would invade other nations. We, we just are experiencing that right now in our world of seeing the you know, Russian leader invade Ukraine. And, 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 and a lot of people have said it's about power and control. It's about uh, having possession of, a, of the electrical plants over there. It's having a possession of the oil plants or the, or the gas uh, over there, the natural gas. It's having possession of those things. You know, Ukraine provides America with a large percentage of our wheat. Provides the world with a large percentage of wheat. Control. Power. And, and, and what has he said? That was mine. And I'm going back and taking it. Listen, that's happened throughout history. And it will continue to happen until Jesus comes again. And then, then all power will be revealed to who has all power. Okay? But the reality is we have seen that world dominance, leaders seeking to have world do dominance. We see it in other aspects of life, the unbridled passion and desire to have what others have so that I can take advantage of others and I'll do everything I can in order to get that. We actually see the problem in our society. It's becoming even greater, if you will. Um, you ever heard of the word looting? <laughs> How about stealing and shoplifting? It, it's become so common practice in our world today, and it's become almost okay. As long, I mean, in some cities, it's okay as long as you don't steal more than $1,000. You won't be prosecuted. So what is it? It's been legalized. Has it, I mean, essentially, it's been legalized. You can go ahead and do that as long as you don't steal more than $1,000 at each event. And now they, they, they have these gangs, uh, the, these, these gangs in America, they're, they're, that's their practice now. They go in and they loot a store and they tell everybody, don't take more than $1,000 you know, $1, and, and leave the store and then we'll go to another store. And that's how they're financing their gangs and their and their activities, and so on. It's interesting. Listen to this. In May of 2020, the number, the amount of gold, goods that were stolen in America was $15 billion. $15 billion. Okay, in May of 2020. In November of 2021, that went up to $45 billion. $30 billion increase in a year and a half of looting and stealing in our society, just in America. You know how much that costs you? How much it costs taxpayers every minute? $75,000 million, $75, a minute it's costing us because of what that does to our economy. Now, you, know, you, you may not think that's a big deal, right? But here, here's a startling statistic. 27 million people in America have shoplifted. That's 10% of our population. It's a problem. 10% of our population has shoplifted. 25% of them are adults, I mean, are kids or juveniles. 75% of those who shoplift are adults. 47% of the high school students admitted that they had, been shop, they had shoplifted before. I know statistics. I know you can just kind of greed greed i remember walking through the store one time i don't know how old i was but i was not that old and my i asked my dad for something and he said no you know what derek did derek picked it up put it in his pocket when his dad wasn't looking and he went home you know what derek did about 15 minutes later after he got home he had that out of his pocket and he went into the grocery store and he apologized for stealing it and paid for it and didn't get to take it home <laughs> Yeah. I wanted something, maybe at five or six years old, that I was told, no, you can't have. And I took it because I, I know, I probably didn't understand greed at that point, but I understood that I was told no, and I understood that I was not allowed to have it, and I understood that I could take it without my dad looking and get away with it, or thought I could. 
How many people today are greedy for the things of this world and possessions and power and so on and are willing to do whatever it takes to have it with no thought whatsoever? Let, let me share with you some things that could be classified in this idea of greed. Gambling, that's a sense of greed. You want something for nothing or you want to try and get something that you don't have. Shoddy work, and you say, well, what's shoddy work have to do with it? Well, because I want to charge you a price, and I want to get away with doing as little work as I can and get the same price from you. That's greed. It's about I want more than what you're paying for. All right? How about this? Constantly showing up late to work or leaving work early. Now, I know that we have fluid time schedules sometimes. I, I get that, and I know that there's times when we're late and we stay over. I, I get that. And, and those things happen sometimes, and, you know, cars break down and everything else. But I wonder if we ever purposely get up in the morning and say, I don't really care what my boss says. I'm going to be late because they can't do it without me. A little bit of greed, isn't there? Of power and control. How about taking things from work? You ever took a pencil or a paper clip or a piece of paper or something, a ream of paper, or something like that, or, or just, you know, anything. Uh, deceitful practices, embezzlement, overcharging for something, corporate fraud. fraud. Now, we'll say, oh, that's greed. Or how about copyright laws? I, I wonder how many, and I, I really, we, we copy, we do, we, we copy songs to, so we can use them and so on, uh, but we don't make them and use them and share them. We get, our, we put our songs up here. You know, if we didn't have our, um, our, our, we have a certificate that allows us to put songs up there, that if we didn't have that, we would be breaking the law. There's copyright laws, all right? And, and there are things that we're supposed to do and things that we can and cannot do as a church because of copyright laws. If we do those things and not care, then what we're doing, we're stealing. I want to do what I want to do. I don't care what they say. That's a sense of greed, covetousness. How about adultery? I want him or her. <laughs> and so we gain power. How about extortion or blackmail? I, I mean, think about this. The word greed is advantage, aggression, desire for advantage. It's a burning passion for something that you want. L listen to what greed does to you, though. See, see here's the problem. I, I read an article this morning, I, it was either this morning or last night, that the, the debt of America, of families, is up to 15 trillion dollars this first quarter of the year it's what debt you know what debt does debt allows you to have stuff that you can't afford i mean it's that idea and i know that we have some debt that we can't control i get that there's some of those things that happen like hospital bills and things like that that we're paying on but to be able to go with a credit card to buy whatever i want to buy i told alex this morning alex you know what the best thing is about your truck it's paid for and the guys start going, well, I don't know if I got to, you know, I don't know, I don't know if I, my first vehicle was, paid. and they started going around and they started talking about that. I, I know that we have to get loans for homes and sometimes we have to get loans for things, but we have to be careful that we don't grab for things that we don't really need, that God doesn't necessarily think that we need at this point in time in our lives. And it doesn't mean it's wrong to be wealthy. But, and it doesn't mean that we ought to be poor, that we ought to just pursue to be poor. It's this idea of just wanting more. And the debt has gotten to the point, $15 trillion. Family debt in America. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of greed, isn't it? To want things. Listen to what God's Word says about some of the problems that greed causes. Proverbs 15, 27 says this. He who profits, profits illicitly troubles his own home, but he who hates, hates bribes will live. It causes problems at home. Greed will bring problems at home. It will cause problems within a marriage. It'll, it'll help, I mean, it'll raise kids who think that everything, my dad used to say, do you think money grows on, uh, money grows on a tree? And I always used to, no, dad, it doesn't grow on a tree. I, I found out later it does grow on a tree. Apples and oranges and pears and it takes work to get those things and so on like that but the reality the fact is is i think we we lose a concept of being content when we grow up in a home of greed and it just creates problems 
and we want more, we want more. I, I remember the, the, the lady one time that, that in, in Hillsborough that stole from the church. It destroyed her marriage, it destroyed her kids' lives. I mean, it just created a mess. Now, I've heard that, you've heard that. How about the people who won the lottery? They want so much money, they want all that money and everything else, and their family in the process of winning and everything is destroyed. It's gone. You read the stories of those things. It will cause financial problems. It will cause kids who rebel. And you'll have problems because of greed. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says this, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor uh, he who loves abundance with his income. This too is vanity. If you think that more is going to solve your problem, <laughs> wrong. <laughs> it creates more problems. All right? We're never satisfied. And, and see, the problem is, is when we get this, this urge, I, I want a new car, and so you go buy a new car, and you, you, those are expensive today, just to be, be warned. And you go out there and you buy that new car, and three weeks later, you want another new car. And you just keep wanting more and more and more. It's not a new car is wrong. It's just that greed can be coming. You buy it and you're unsatisfied. James 5, 3 says this, Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up, for your, uh, stored up your treasures. I mean, how many people have stuff just they have bought that they think they had to have and and it's just now sat. And you know, there's going to be a day when you die. It's going to go someplace else, to somebody else. It's not going to be yours anymore. <laughs> All right? And it can sit and rust and it'll just fall apart. There, you know, there's going to be a day when everything is burned up. <laughs> it's going to be gone. And yet we live for this world. We live to gain the things of this world. Uh, we, greed will destroy a lot of things. It causes, it leads to idolatry, it leads to worry, it leads to slavery, it leads to debt, it leads to stress, it leads to broken marriage. Now, go back, if you will, to Habakkuk chapter 2. This is where Habakkuk gets in, and uh, this is where God talks to, to him about this idea, if you will, of greed. It's, you know, the Babylonians and so on coming in and so on, but I, I just, what he says here is, is just very interesting, something for us to think about. Will not all of these take up a taunt song against him? So there's going to be a taunt. Somebody's going to taunt the person, this group, okay? Even mockery and insinuations against him and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his. For how long? And he make, and makes himself rich with loans. Will not your creditors rise up suddenly and those who collect from you awaken? Indeed, you will become plunder for them. Because you have looted many nations, all the, rem all the remainder of the peoples will loot you because of the human bloodshed and the violence done to the land, to the town, and to its inhabitants. The phrase, this phrase that you have heard, what goes around comes around, might fit here. They were, the Babylonians were drunk on power and hungered for world dominance. They were arrogant, never satisfied with their last uh, conquest. They swallowed up nations and had a never-ending appetite for destruction and death. The warning from God to Habakkuk is, is that God will hold them accountable. They will be laughed at. They will be ridiculed and scorned by those nations they terrorized. God will pay them back for the things they had done. The unjust power that was, uh, that was used to create their extravagant wealth will be used to undo them. Vengeance, God says, is mine. And when God deals with our greed, He will deal with it harshly. So be careful. First Thessalonians one six says, "For after all, that, uh, after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflicted you. If we afflict people to gain, God will afflict us." with pain as well. The reality, the fact is, is greed does not bring about what people pursue. Having more does not mean that you're going to be popular and you're going to be powerful. In fact, there may come a day when all of that is gone. 
because of your behavior. That God may come and allow something to happen in your life to take that away from you and leave you humbled and begging from God to be helped. Greed, Sir Fred Catherwood said this. I do not know who Sir Fred Catherwood is, but he said this. Greed is the logical result of the belief that there, listen to this, greed is the logical uh, result of the belief that there is no life after death. We grab what we can, while we can, however we can, and then hold on to it hard. Now, those words may be hard for some people. And they may be words that you would say, well, I believe that there's life after death. But the question is not whether we say we believe that. The question is, do we live like we believe that there is life after death? Or do we live as if this is it? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. See, that's the attitude of those who pursue the things of this world, who do not believe that there is life after death. But you and I who are in Christ, because we know from God's Word what we have read, and we know that God keeps His promises, that there is life after death, then what we need to be doing is pursuing that life after death with God. Greed will cause you to do some crazy things. And no one would denounce their convictions of eternity but we have to be careful whether or not we are living as if there is no life after death. Go back to Luke chapter 12. Here's the picture that Jesus gives to us. Remember, he has been asked by somebody in the crowd, Jesus, tell my brother to give me part, to share the inheritance with me, as if he didn't get any in the first place. And then Jesus tells this parable of this man. Oh, I've got all these great crops and everything else. I'm doing well this year. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And Jesus said, God will ask for your soul tonight. You know, there is a, there, it's, it's okay to be rich. It's not okay to be stingy and uncaring and not willing to share. <laughs> and there's that guy's problem. He could have built, I know it's a parable, he could have just filled his barns and then blessed the other people with all the rest he had. But no, no. Jesus implied that he wasn't going to give any of it away and he was going to build bigger barns for himself and he's going to sit back and say, look at me, I can lay back and relax and take it easy. And then he says this in verse 22 of Luke 12. And he said to his disciples, for this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life. Do you think greedy people worry? I think they do. They keep wanting more. And they worry about where they're going to get it and how they're going to get it and who they're going to get it from. But Jesus says, Do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, not your bo- nor your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Hmm. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? In fact, worry causes more health problems. <laughs> That's what, I, I, don't, I wonder if it's the number one cause of cancer or, and heart problems and everything else. My, my father had cancer, and doctor back in that day said, you know, stress is a big cause of cancer. Yeah, worry, big cause of cancer. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what he, his doctor told him. And which of you can worry, can add a single life to this? And if, if then you cannot do, if then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Consider the lilies, how they grow and how they neither toil nor spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. Uh, that's implying that God can dress you better than, all right? All right, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you? You men of little faith, and, you, and, you, and do not seek what you will eat or what you will drink, and do not keep worrying, 
for all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek. I think one, uh, one of the Gospels says they, that, that they, 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 they seek after those things. Okay? It's, it's, and, and it's the worldly people, the people of the world, not Christian. People of the world seek after those things. And we can't be like that. Okay? And uh, he said, for the, all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things, but seek first his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. So how do we do it? Trust God. How do we overcome greed in our life? Just trust God. Well, I shared earlier with you that, that definition from Bible Hub, that greed is having a desire for more or lusting for a greater number of temporal things that go beyond what God determines is eternally best, beyond what He prefers, His will prefers. And we just read about uh, there in, in Luke what Jesus said about how God will take care of us. I'm blessed. I, I am blessed. I am blessed more than I deserve. I'll be honest with you. I have more than I can imagine. All right? And I almost have more than I can handle. <laughs> All right? Well, there's days I go, man, I got too much. <laughs> Lord, take it away, you know? But, but the reality, the fact is, is we can look around us and we see how blessed we are, and yet we want more, and that's that greed. It, it's, see, trusting God because of who He is and he, how much He cares for us and letting Him take care of us Listen, he can do a better job taking care of Derek Stump than Derek Stump can do. And he can do a better job taking care of you than you can. You remember Psalm 23 starts out with these words, The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not be in want. If we trust God to be our God, if we trust Him to be our shepherd, then we have to trust Him to take care of us and not go with this uncontrolled desire to get more than what he has already determined that we need or that we is is according to his will or that is eternally in our best interest and sometimes those things can take us away from god we can have so much taking care of so much doing spending our time and our resources and everything else taking care of the things that we have then we lose our sight of god how many people do you know that can't have a relationship with God? I'm not talking about coming to church. I'm just talking about can't have a relationship with God because they're do, too busy taking care of stuff that doesn't have any eternal, well, let me say this. It may have an eternal consequence, but it doesn't have an eternal promise. And yet they take care of all that stuff, and they want more, and they want more, and they want more, and God's... Their relationship with God just goes to the side. We are valued by God, and God knows our needs, and God will take care of us. Trusting in the world does not lead to us being taken care of. It's telling God that we don't need Him to take care of us, that we can take care of ourselves. Learn to be content. I, I like this definition of contentment. It's realizing all that God provides is always enough i like that and it doesn't mean it's wrong to be rich as i said earlier and it doesn't mean that we ought to seek to be poor it just means that we are taking we are taking god at his word that he will take care of us and that we then choose to be good stewards of what he's given to us it just means that we're focused on god letting him provide that which is in his will to take care of us for our eternal best interest it means that we're focused on kingdom and not the things of this world see satan wants us as christians sometimes to focus on the possessions and the things of this world so that we lose sight of kingdom and then we stop being kingdom minded and we stop being kingdom servants we seek for god to be honored and be glorified through our lives and in our possessions and we trust Him to take care of us. Be good stewards. Trust God. Be content. And be a good steward. Take care of what you have. How much stuff do we have laying around that we've let go because we don't have time to take care of it because we just bought something else we need to take care of? You know? But I have to have that, too. And then pretty soon we'll buy something else to take care of that. And it just keeps getting bigger. 
And it's, again, not wrong to have those things. Just make sure that it doesn't take you away from God in the process. Set a budget and live within it. Get out of debt and stay out of debt. Again, Alex, don't ever buy a car on loan. Start making your payments today for your next vehicle. You already got a vehicle that's paid for. See, that's that idea of never being out of debt. Now, I put this one in here because you remember last, a couple weeks ago I talked to you about HGTV? Stop watching HGTV <laughs> and stop looking at Facebook Marketplace. Stop filling your minds with the things of this world that causes you to be tempted with wanting more. Seriously, though, if HGTV causes you to greed and want and covet and desire to have more of those things, then you probably ought to stop watching it. But you probably ought to stop looking at truck ads and car ads, too, if it causes you to sin. I used to go through parking lots with Gary on lunch breaks sometimes, and, oh, I looked at, boy, that'd be a nice truck to have. There's nothing wrong with that until that desire became controlling and you'd be willing to do whatever you could to get it. Or if you did buy it, to put your family at risk. Yeah. Greed. It's a battle. It's a battle within, and we have to keep working at it every single day. That's why God told Habakkuk, be on guard. Beware of it. Be on guard against it. God, listen to this. God does not want Satan to steal you from him because of greed. God wants you. God sent his son to die for you. God wants to keep you in his fold as his child. And greed might just lead you away. Be careful. Beware. Guard against greed. If you're outside of Christ today, Maybe it's the sin of greed that's got hold of you and has taken control of your life. Turn that over to God. It doesn't mean all of your financial problems will be solved today. But it means you'll be on a road. You'll be on a road that God's going to walk with you to help you get through that. But maybe that's not your sin. Maybe you've got another sin. Maybe it's some other sin in your life. I know this. Sin will keep you out of heaven. Sin will keep you out of heaven. And Jesus died for your sins so you could get into heaven. So if you're outside of Christ today, let me encourage you to come. Call us. Give me, a phone, give me a ring. Derek, need to talk to you. Send me a text message. Send me an email. Whatever you need to do to get a hold of me. Let us help you. For those of us who are in Christ, maybe we've allowed greed or something else to get a hold of us, and it's controlling us in our life. Let's get deal with that. Let's repent. Let's change. Confess that. And let's move on. Let's grow. Let's get that out of our life. Let's deal with it. Let's address it. Let's go to the Word and find out what God says about it, and let's resolve that in our lives. Satan is doing everything he can to steal you. And God's doing everything he can to keep you. But we have to decide. We have to decide where we're going to spend our time and our energy and our money and our efforts and what we're going to focus on. A relationship with God or a relationship with Satan. It's our choice. Satan's going to be busy and we ought to get busy. Standing guard, protecting ourselves, being aware, being alert of what's going on and what his goals are. God loves you. God has sent his son to die for you. And he's available for you today. Let's stand. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me.
lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me all my heart to him i give ever to him i'll cling in his blessed presence live ever his praises sing love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best songs faithful loving service to to him belongs love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love Corinthians 11 26 tells us for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes we will be gathering at our Savior's table this morning uh, our communion hymn we'll be singing he lifted me then brother Kelly why will come with a, his meditation he lifted me If you have a TV, you've probably spent at least a little bit of time watching a crime show, if you have it on. In fact, you've probably watched more than one. There's quite a bit out there. But have you noticed that with all the different crime shows that are out there, the same thing happens at the end of every episode of every show. When the cops find out who the guilty person is and they go to confront them, that person starts crying and saying how sorry they are for doing what they did. Even though in the beginning of the episode, they had been interviewed several times by the cops, but they were perfectly fine and nothing seemed to bother them and they weren't crying then. So what changed? Well, they had the evidence brought against them and then now they know that they have to face the punishment. So now, now is when they feel sorry and they start crying for it. That is how we are as sinners every day. We commit sin all the time, and we just keep going through our day without a care in the world. It is only when we are confronted and facing punishment that we feel sorry for what we have done. God knows that we are going to sin and that we are going to keep sinning until it is time for our punishment. But he doesn't want us to face that because he can't stand to let us suffer. That is why he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins, so our punishment was already taken on by Jesus. 
We take communion to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made by taking on our sins. So that way we don't have to end up like the people at the end of those shows. We can be free of our sin and be with God in heaven. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have to gather here and to worship you, God. And I pray that as we take this time to honor the sacrifice that Jesus made, I pray that you bless the emblems that represent the body and the blood that freed us of our sins. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. We've come to the end of our service this morning, and we would like to thank those of you who have been with us online today, and hopefully uh, you'll be with us again the next Lord's Day. We'll be here at 1030 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Uh, we do not have a broadcast in, on Sunday evening, but we will be having services at 6 o'clock tonight. So thank you for joining us, and thank you to the ones who are here in person, and we'll see you next week. Sue will now have uh, some piano music to close us out.